Hey everybody, good morning. Um, I seem to have uh, forgotten to plug Justin into my ear, so right away it's that kind of morning again. <laughs> this whole week is just fraught with peril. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> I've just decided to give up and capitulate and just go with the silly because they're just there just can't be enough silly, possibly. How was everybody Cinco de Mayo? Did you all drink Corona and like eat awesome fish tacos like we did? Hello, everybody. I'll say hellos in a moment. Eh, there we go. Gotta plug Justin into my ear. This is the longest Monday ever. Margaret, that is so true. I agree. How's everyone doing this morning, by yes, the way? Yes, Rex, same am time, same am channel. But uh, but I actually like I slept pretty well last night, so I'm like yeah 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 it's a day. <laughs> so let me say my good mornings to everyone. We've got a numbat and a D Clearman and a Margaret and a Stephanie and a Robin and a Nomad Zeke and a Threads of Fate and an Androcrat and a Rax. Hey Rax, good to see you. And uh, I didn't think I saw you for a couple of days this week, or maybe you just weren't talking. Um, do 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 do. You've declared when I've had enough Corona to last the rest of my life. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I had, I don't know why I hauled it with me from Texas, but I have one of those little tiny shot bottles, you know, the tiny little bottles of things. I actually had one of Patron, so David is like, I'm making a margarita. So he made himself a tiny mango margarita last night, which was really funny. Um, so he had a margarita. I did not have a margarita, probably for the best. Uh, I did, however, have one of my gluten-free beers. And a Corona. And regretted the Corona deeply. So <laughs> I will probably have to not do that again. Pardon me while I straighten out my setup here. So you've been working too much? Aw, Rax, I'm sorry. I hope that lightens up for you in the future. You made homemade salsa. Good job, Threads of Fate. We made um, homemade um, cilantro lime slaw, which went on our fish tacos and also was our side dish. Um, and that turned out really, really well. So I actually was thrilled about that. It's really tasty. Um, and the fish tacos turned out okay. Like, we used cod, and they probably would have been a little better with mahi because it flakes a little bit better maybe, but it has a little bit more firmness to it. But it was baked. It was breaded and baked. I, I don't have a fryer. So, but, but it's still tasty. still pretty tasty. We made homemade guacamole because we do that pretty much every day. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was good. It was a good Cinco. We had a good dinner. And then, of course, we had the banana bread, i.e. the pudding. Banana bread in a pudding uh, form, uh, <laughs> which we tried to put under the broiler this morning and, and promptly charred the edges because it's just so moist. But yeah, it was good. It was good. Oh my god, Rex. That's just rough. 120 hours, how are you still alive? Like, a body needs sleep and food and detox. Like, I really admire you, man. That's, healthcare is hardcore. And, like, people who do it, like, all the respect. Because the things you have to deal with, and then when something big happens like this, the hours uh, are just, like, hard on you. Like, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So, kudos to you for, for staying in there, man. Or dude. Or, or woman. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what some of you are. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Well, let's get to, let's get to doing some painting and uh, we can talk about, hey, Crispies. Hello, hello. Let's, uh, let's make sure I deactivate my pro tips intro. I remembered this morning. So I do have two brain cells to rub together and I just used one of them. <laughs> so there we go. Oh, yeah. Uh, five or six hours of sleep is not enough for most people. I feel so bad. Sometimes I think that our society, like, just prioritizes, has the wrong priorities, right? Instead of trying to make sure that we're all, like, healthy and operating at a good level and a healthy level, like, sometimes it just feels like society is like, nope, we need this, sorry. Um, it just feels so inefficient sometimes to me. There we go. There's our giantess. Oh, raccoon. Oh, yeah. I bet you have bags under your eyes like crazy. Hey, Monohost. Good morning. So we're going to talk, we're going to continue to talk about color composition on our uh, Frost Giantess. And then I thought I would do some of these little details um, and uh, do like painting like the stitches and other fine stuff. So let me find my glasses because we all know that I am blind without them, at least close up. I have very good vision normally. Um, as I went to the eye doctor because I was worried because I knew my close-in vision was... Uh, getting bad like i had to have the reading glasses to paint minis um 
and she uh, she did my eye all my eye tests, and she's like, "You have better than twenty twenty vision, except for your close in vision." And I'm like, "Aw, it's not fair." David is nearsighted, and he gets to make out like a band aid because his close in vision he's not losing that. He'll probably lose his far out vision first. It's just not fair. Anyway, let's see here. Let's see. Let's see. I'm just gonna make my Twitch chat is just a little bit off kilter. Let me make sure that it is an appropriate frame just so that I can see you all. So yeah, Miss Frost Giant. So let's do. Let me find her skin color quick because I want to have it on board. Or maybe I kept it out yesterday. Yeah, I did. I was smart. All right, good. Excellent. And we can move palette back into frame now. Do, 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 do. There. Palette. Crooked palette. Not crooked palette. There. Uh, hey, Holly Monster. Hey, Miss Dimp. Uh, oh, Lasek. Yeah, I've heard people, I mean, the majority of people that I've heard uh, had that Krispies uh, really are very happy that they did. Um, hey, Sentimental. Good morning. But yeah, so uh, good for you. Awesome. So let's make a... Usually when I do white or gray or silver hair, I do start with a straight up gray and then highlight it. Um, I might add a little bit of her skin color to it to make it match better. So let's start with just a touch of cloudy gray, like maybe four drops of cloudy gray, which is a pretty dark gray, so I'm going to lighten it. Um, because I don't want to, the thing with painting white when you're shading it with gray or a gray blue, anything really, is that you don't want to go too dark. Uh, a lot of people make this mistake when they're starting out. They put really dark gray shadows on their white. Really, in reality, unless it's in a really deep fold, uh, white cloth and white things don't get really dark gray unless they're in deep shadow. So for the hair up here, which really doesn't have any parts that are in deep shadow unless it's around her face, I don't want to go as dark as cloudy. Um, usually my darkest I would go be like rainy, but I've cloudy is the color I've got to hand. So cloudy is what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to just mix some white in it to get it more to the level I would normally start with. And we're going to do this for her hair. And I think I am going to add a touch of blue for two reasons. One is that pale hair can be more translucent. And so you can see some of the skin color through it. Um, and, uh, two is to differentiate it from this. Cause remember what we're talking about is making fine details stand out and making areas of the miniature stand out and getting contrast, right? So if we're going to do both of these, um, as you know, a light, a silver hair, and then, uh, maybe wolf fur and the wolf fur is going to go up to white on the edges, then I want to get contrast in any way I can. So if I make the hair shift a little bit blue, which fits with her skin, and then I make the wolf pelt shift a little bit brown, those two things will be much easier. Uh, it'll be much easier to see they're two different surfaces. And we want that. We don't want it to run together if we're going to do light and light. So doo -doo -doo. let's see here. Yeah, there we go. So, so what you've got here, yeah, we've got, just to remind you guys, what we've got so far is you've got ruddy leather, because I decided I'd, I liked it better dark. Um, then we've got heraldic red. Uh, I did shade the heraldic red with a little bit of dragon on the shield here to bring out the little, uh, the little, uh, ah, board marks, seam lines. That's what I'm going for. Let me see if I can get this even closer. Let's see. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah, so I put in, you can see the little lines between the boards there. Um, I really think this model was would be more in scale if she was an inch taller. I kind of wish that we were able to do that. But our giants would truly get gigantic, like t totally ginormous. I mean, it would be amazing. And our cloud, our storm giants are that big. And cloud giants are supposed to be shorter, which, or sorry, frost giants are supposed to be a lot shorter. So that's probably what we're dealing with. But yeah. Uh, all right. So let's get a little bit of blue. We've got four drops of cloudy gray. I'm going to put one drop of ashen blue, which is the color we use for her skin. Just to give it a little tiny bit of blue shift. And you know, your eye might not catch it right away, but it will push it subtly apart from the fur when we do the fur. And a drop of white. When did giant giant be fitting? Yes. Yeah, I think so, Sarjiki. We all wish she was bigger. Yeah, I love the pygmy elk, actually. <laughs> You're right, it is a pygmy elk. You know what, though? Maybe they breed them in herds so that they always have tiny snack packs. Like, I could see frost giants doing that. You know, if they find the dwarf gene, they're like, hey, this is easier to carry around. 
So, you know, giants might think that way. I'm going to adjust my face cam a little bit. I'm a little bit off. There I am. A little bit better. Having uh, switched chairs, I need to uh, kind of adjust myself a bit more. Try to make sure that I'm in frame and uh, haven't quite dialed in the face cam perfectly yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still a little bit off. Yeah, I'll only mess with it a little bit. There we go. Much better. House elks. Yes, house elks. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we that needs to be a thing now. Tell Jason he needs to sculpt a whole herd of them. All right, so now I'm going to take some water. Where's my water? There it is. Put a couple drops in there. Since I washed this many, I can go with a thinner base coat and the paint will still stick. So it's about a three to one for the base coat at this point. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think she's a dwarf giant because she's in scale with all the rest of our giants. I'm more likely to believe that this is a dwarf elk because I could totally see giants breeding herds of dwarf elk. Then you can eat more than one at a sitting, right? Yeah. It's the idea behind sliders. It's so you can eat multiple cheeseburgers in one sitting. Yeah, exactly. If there's already a mini mastodon, then it makes sense. We have, we have, uh, <laughs> Reaper has been never known for consistency of scale anyway, guys. <laughs> Although our giants are very consistent, I think, uh, in accordance with what they're supposed to be. All right, so let's put a nice coat of gray on here. This is very close to rainy gray, what I've mixed up. I may have done a little bit too much water, but that's fine. I can put two coats on if I have to. I see the bones material through it I'll do too oh and hey this has reminded me that I'm Mr. Ears so I need to paint ears so I'll need to mix up some ash and uh, blue but that's fine because I wanted to touch the face up a little bit anyway see forgetting stuff it's a feature it gives you an excuse to remix up colors that you uh, thought you were done with I'm going to go in here a little bit around the face to take down this dark shadow a little bit. I'm still going to leave the shadow in the deepest parts, though. Like, I want the shadow. I just don't want it quite as dark and as wide as it is. And since I held off on the hair, I knew I could touch this up later. I also need to touch up her forehead. I got an errant brush stroke there. Doo -doo -doo. Let's see here. Oh no, Nomad Zeke. I'm sorry about video quality. I hope it's okay. But yeah, I like our Frost Giants a lot. The Fire Giants are clunky. I know they're based on Wayne Reynolds' art, and they are pretty cool and styling. Um, the Queen is still my favorite, but, uh, but I do like our Frost Giants a lot. I think they're, uh, they've got a cool and unique style. And these new ones that are really geared and kitted out um, are really interesting to me and fun. It's not just a giant in a loincloth anymore, right? Or a fur, fur loincloth in the case of frost giants. Fur bikini in the case of female frost giants. Doo -doo -doo. And then we'll get the back. Alrighty, we have our hair with a solid base coat on it, light gray. Yeah, Margaret, I think it's intentional. Um, hey, Zuo. Um, so we, oh, hold on. The giantess, we can't get out to salons due to quarantine. The giantess can't get her hair done. <laughs> All right, so zero. I uh, I would normally use like rainy gray for white hair for a base. Um, with white, I always start with the shadow color and go up. Uh, but I didn't have rainy gray to hand, so I actually mis mixed four drops of cloudy gray, which is ninety eighty nine, um, with one drop of her skin color to give it a little coolness and to make it work together a little better, and then uh, one drop of white. So it's four one one, uh, which gives me a color very close to rainy gray. And I do need to mix up some ash in blue because I re realized I forgot to paint her ears and I also need to touch up her face. Uh, another thing that I will do, guys, uh, whenever I'm working with a darker skin with lighter hair, which as I mentioned, does tend to be a little bit more translucent, um, 
one tip to make things look more realistic and definitely do this on bigger models or busts um, but often the skin color will show a little bit down the part of the hair so take a little bit of your ashen blue or this this is really true with dark elves a little bit of your skin color and use that instead of a, like you know normally when we paint hair we're just using a darker version of the hair color right down that part a lot of the time um, but when you've got a dark skin tone or a darker than your hair anyway uh, you can totally get away with mixing a little bit of that into that part to show the skin color down the part of the hair. Um, I like it. It adds a little sense of realism uh, to the model. I'm going to touch up this horrible line that I managed to gouge into her forehead. There we go. Touched up. Still need to probably highlight that. Hey, Solison. Yay. Talking about pygmy wildlife in chat. You know, like you do. So I'm going to put a little bit of this ashen blue right down the part. It will help to suggest her skin color and tie the hair together. All of these little touches of realism make it look like that, you know, help it add like, yeah, this is really her hair. And yeah, it, you can even see her scalp color through it. That kind of thing. Alrighty. Got that, and now I need to get her ears. I probably need some walnut to line around there. Doo -doo -doo. I go through so much walnut brown. I should own, I should own like fifty bottles of it because I will use it all eventually. What's your favorite shadow color, everybody? Are you like me? Are you walnut brown fans? Do you use a crap ton of it, or is there are there other colors that you uh, use for shading regularly, or lining? We're just going to mix up some walnut. And I do use the liners. Although, weirdly, I'm more likely to use the liners for actual colors <laughs> than I am to line these days. Muddy brown. Yeah, that's cool. I hadn't heard that. I do like muddy brown. It's one of my favorite of favorites of the early browns. It's a nice, nice warm neutral that goes with so many different things. All right, let's line around her ear and paint it. Where is the ear on this side? I can barely see it. Red brick, yeah, red brick is really nice too. That's that's one of my like closet favorites, crispy. Um, I've always always loved that color. A lot of people seem to like not like it as much because they like warmer reds or lighter reds, but I've always really liked red brick. So I'm with you there. Don't really have a shadow yet, Quinny. That's okay. Try them all. Hey, that just means that you're not locked in. You can try all of the paints and decide what you like to use. The reason that I'm using um, walnut as a liner, and the reason that I like to do it, is that uh, it's got really, really good coverage. The liner paints, I tend to use those for lining on bigger like busts and things like that, or historical models. And the reason is that uh, those are kind of a little bit translucent. And so with a little bit of thinning, you can get a very natural shadow, kind of a very subtle line, whereas this is more of a cartoony. You know, it's very, very bold. It's very black. So for smaller models where I'm going for a more cartoon look, um, I like walnut because once I thin it down, it still has really good coverage. So I can get a really solid line, which I want on really small minis. Um, but when it comes to more subtle effects, realistic effects, or if I was going less cartoony, uh, I would reach for probably brown liner instead because I could tune it a little easier. Walnut's a very bold color, so it's always going to kind of smack you in the face when you're doing lining with it. And I could paint this ear and then line it, but I'm getting, I, this way I can be a little messy with my liner and just touch it up with the blue when I go in to do it. And I still have my gray open, so when I do that, things like blurf it right there, I can touch that up. Oh, another, another vote for Reaper Red Brick. Awesome. You know, Brick Red, I might have to do that. I might have to try it. I've never used it in that capacity, but now you guys have gotten me curious. Maybe I'll have to do it. I've got a bottle right over in my, my paint thing. Interesting. Yeah, Coal Black is a good one too, Andrecreta. I can see how people would really like Coal Black to do. If you like cooler shadows, because Walnut is a little warmer. It has brown in it, whereas Coal Black has um, blue and green in it. So... It's definitely going to give you a different effect, even if it's subtle. 
Uh, yeah, I do love blue liner. Um, and it, it varies uh, as far as which minis I, I opt for blue liner and which ones I opt for other colors on. But I am a huge blue liner fan. And I do use it regularly as a, just a paint, as a color, because I love the, the color it makes when I mix it with various whites. Because I'm a blue green or a uh, blue, uh, gray blue fanatic. I'm going to touch up the blur if I got onto her hair there. So going somewhat dark, even though I want her hair to go up to pure white, going somewhat dark, what it's doing for me is when I look at these braids here, I'm going to leave this, this medium gray in the shadows. It's going to make it much easier to make those braids stand out um, without extra shading. Although I could certainly add some extra shading to bring them out if I decide they need it. You like washes for your shadows, Rex? That's cool. Yeah, coal black. Another vote for coal black. I've got coal black around here somewhere. You know, I kind of have the same problem with my paint that I do with my spices, which is I've got way too much of it. So currently what I have taken to doing is I have a box where they're all separated according to color, a big box a full of paint in baggies. And uh, then I have my little drawer next to me and my drawer is full of the paints that I use often. So what I'm doing over time is I'm... Uh, taking paints out of there that I'm not using and adding paints in that I am using. So I should slowly uh, shift my at hand, at hand paint collection to be exactly what I need. Cause yeah, definitely there are definitely colors that I reach for more often. So I want those close at hand, but I don't mind having to dig a little bit if I'm using a specific separate color for a specific project. And then I have my bag of clear brights just like right at hand um, almost all the time because I use my clears all the time. All right, so we've got our little ears. We'll get a little highlight going on there. No, Sethany, not at all. I know D. Clearman also has wall racks. A lot of people, when you've got a big paint collection, it's just, if you've got the room for it, it's very expedient. I don't have the room for wall racks in this apartment, so I am uh, making do, um, I don't know. I've always, it's, it's weird. It's, it's a little hard for me because I like a very kind of a clean and organized. I like to keep my, my area fairly organized and it bothers me when stuff builds up and when I have it all around. So I kind of like to hide my paint out of mind. If I, out of sight, out of mind, if I am not directly using it. All right. We're going to take some of this blue and add some white to it just so I can highlight those ears quick and then we'll work on the hair. Yeah, it makes you happy. Yeah. Organize. Hey, whatever makes you happy. Everybody who has talked to any artist at all or is an artist knows that everybody's got a different process, right? So what, what uh, makes your process really, really run along smoothly is going to be totally different from what my process or anybody else's process. So no judge at all. It is, uh, it's all, it's all fair, right? Because what's really important is what uh, environment inspires you to work on stuff. And what, uh, what environment really starts to cramp down on your creativity and avoid that, you know? So let me see. We're just going to highlight that upper edge of that ear and the lower edge a little bit just to bring out the shape of it. And we'll get onto the hair. I don't want to spend too much time on these ears. Although they are very similar color uh, and shade to the hair around it. So once we get the hair down, again, going for contrast, what I may find myself doing is reaching for the... Uh, the runic glow that we used for her cheeks to bring out the color in her cheeks and actually applying a touch of it to like her earlobes, which would be pinker. Um, and that will help to make sure that the ears stand out against the hair. So let's do our hair. Yeah. Right. Dirty dishes and all the rest of it, all the debris, right? There's priorities and there's priorities. Let's do five drops of white. Let's thin it down with two drops of water and see. Well, let's do three. Always remember you have to, if you want white to kind of blend, if you don't want a solid brush stroke, you have to thin it more than other colors because uh, titanium white pigment is the highest coverage pigment, which means that it will fight you if you want it to go kind of translucent where you want to build it up in layers. So you got to thin it more than other paints. 
Let's see if I thinned it enough or too much. I like my paint to be semi-solid when I start layering up white on something like this hair. So let's see here. And I want to leave a dark shadow near the center here where I put down some of that blue. And I want to always be using a brush stroke that's in the direction the hair would grow. And I want to suggest strands, even if they're not sculpted. I want to suggest that there are like locks and strands at this stage. And it doesn't matter if it looks like stripes at this stage. I'll use glazing to kind of tie it together later. But I just want uh, I just want that suggestion. And if there's a place where the hair will definitely catch the light, I'll kind of muddy up my strands into more of a just a block of white. And then I'll bring those strands back as we drop into the shadow. Because I know that where that hair, hair is uh, coming out into the light, where it's catching the light, it's going to be brighter. And same up here at the really at the top of the head. Kind of bring it together to a band of light there. And this is kind of just blocking in your highlights and shadows on your white hair. I seem to be getting off topic a lot lately. I'm like, I will do fine details today and contrast again. And then I'm like, oh, but I need to paint white hair because I need to show how to make the fur look different from the hair. So I guess we're painting white hair today in addition to everything else. Now you need your fine motor control because you got to pick out these little braids, which actually are sculpted pretty well. So it's not as much of a pain as it could be. And once again, I'm just blocking these in and it looks really stark, but you can always put a little bit of a wash or glaze of uh, the gray mixture you've got or of white, depending on what you're trying to do over the top. If you feel that your braids have gotten kind of clunky. And sometimes the sculpt is really clear at the beginning and then it kind of goes sideways as it gets lower down. So just do what you can to suggest little bands and rolls. And try to keep a shadow next to the braid so that your braid will stand out. Hi, Kroniko. Hey, Beowulf, thanks for that sub. Thanks for the prime sub. How do I not get tide lines from glazing? Never let it pool, Dan Shan. That's the, the trick to glazing. You never, ever let it pool. You brush it on in a super thin, um, pardon me while I adjust my seat, a uh, super thin layer, and then you right away, like, rinse out your brush and squeeze the water out of it and wick away all your excess, and that keeps you from getting tide lines. Tide lines are caused by excess paint that has broken. It has been thinned so extremely that it will not hold together. You've broken the bonds between the resins, essentially. So the answer to that is to really put it down and then wick off all the excess. Never leave it to dry as a wash. Washes are thicker than glazes because you are, you know, you're trying to leave them uh, in puddles on the model. And the problems that people have with washes right away are because they've thinned them too much. Especially when you remember that acrylic paints, when they're thinned, they will always dry lighter than they look. So you want your wash to be darker than you think um, to create the effect you need. Yeah, the details here are getting a little bit clunky near the bottom. So just kind of keep with your alternating uh, pattern on your braid. She could just do really messy braids. She is a frost giant. They probably don't have great hairdressers. There, get a little bit of that. Her hair is kind of chunky up near the top, so I doubt she's put a comb through it anytime soon. Remember, you want kind of... Um, a solid uh, succession of lines. When you're doing the crown of the head, you want to leave kind of a halo effect up here because that's where light hits. Yeah, no problem, don't you? Let's see here. And again, you always want to use a brush stroke, even when you're not paying attention, especially when you're not paying attention to trying to hit all the strokes when you're just trying to like create the texture. Always brush in the direction the hair is growing. You can sort it out afterwards. But if your brush strokes are going in the right direction, nobody's probably going to notice whether you're actually hitting these strands or not. And if you want, you can leave a little bit of a suggestion of some strokes going down into the part, especially where the sculpt suggests it, so that you don't have a big dark space running down the middle. But a little bit of a dark space is not a problem. I don't want that. I want to kind of bring in more strands here. There. 
that's more like that. Bob Ross in it, yeah. Ross Chain hairdresser needs to be a new class, right? Hey, those scissors are probably pretty vicious. Yeah, exactly, Nomad Zeke. There you go. And you're welcome on that cool old timer. Bob Ross in it is totally legit. I'm going to continue and now trying to actually hit the strands of hair as I go down. But once again, I mean, if you're a little rough on this, guys, don't worry about it. Like, you just need to get, be close. It's more important to get the appearance of the hair right than to hit every strand perfectly. And a lot of times, if the sculpt is chunkier, like with this Ross Jane, who probably has really, like, half dreadlocks in her hair, um, it's not as important to be precise. You just want to suggest the right texture and color for your hair. And if the chunky, if there is chunky texture and it makes you annoyed, um, you know, you could practice with some green stuff to smooth it out. I'm actually, uh, there's texture that I'm not a fan of actually on, um, Miss Frost Giant here. Her hair is, uh, very, very, um, deeply folded and I want it to be more shallow, more natural like that. So I am going to take some green stuff to the top of her head and make those, um, all of those locks uh, a little bit more shallow and put more texture in there. So, you know, practicing, that's actually a really nice way to practice with green stuff because you just are, are localized. You just have to use one tool with a sharp edge and you can practice your, uh, your hair texture, which is one of the better, I think, better textures to learn to deal with green stuff on. MJ Studio Arts, I mean, it depends on what you're doing, right? If I'm painting for competition, you better bet they're going to get, like, super close to it with magnification. So, but if you're just painting for the game table, yeah, it doesn't matter. If you're painting a bunch of Frost Giants, who cares? Just, it's it's an opportunity at that point. Depending on if you just, if you just want to paint gaming models, then rock it. If you're trying to get better, then it actually does pay to spend a little extra time on your gaming models practicing certain things, right? So, because it's a gaming model, so if you mess it up, it doesn't matter. So it's actually a great practice uh, subject to try to get better at certain things. And what I used to do, like when I was painting for eBay, which, you know, I was, I was painting just, uh, just trying to get as many models done as I could, but every model I would try to practice like one thing and try to make, get better at one thing. And so over time I did get better. Um, so it depends on what your goals are as far as a miniature painter. If you want to paint faster, if you want to paint better, if you want to do both. All these are things that you can practice on, on your D&D or gaming models. Um, just depends on what you want to do. Mostly I just started out wanting to be happy with my own models. Like wanting to be able to look at my model and be proud of it. Um, and uh, I started, I have a 2D artist background. So there were certain things that I enjoyed like smooth blends uh, that I wanted to get good at, you know, stuff like that. So and then I just went down the rabbit hole and started practicing all sorts of weird techniques. And, and then I started teaching them, which was what really led to me becoming better at them because I had to analyze what I was doing and why it worked because I had to explain it. Right. So if you start teaching miniature painting, whether you're streaming or teaching classes at your local game store, once they reopen or uh, teaching at cons, you know, all that sort of thing, um, teaching people will make you become a better painter because you must, uh, explain why what you're doing works. And once you do that, you start noticing more things like that. Like, well, this works, but would this work better? You know, so teaching really is an excellent way to get better at painting. Plus, sometimes your students have ideas for a way to do something and they're, you're, they're going to ask you, will this work? And you're going to be like, oh, no idea. Well, let's try it. Always be open to uh, different ways of doing stuff. Yeah, faces are tiny. I mean, don't worry about blending faces is what it comes down to, Quinny. If, if you are painting tiny faces, like 28 millimeter, don't worry about blending. It's just, you don't even need to. I mean, thin your paint just a little bit. You do need to have, have like, a smooth base coat on a face is more important than good blends, I think. 
Um, because you can be a little choppy with your highlights, but if your paint is smooth and it's not clumpy and you, you know, it's, it's a good, nice, smooth layer, it's going to go a long way toward looking like a face and learning, learning to make your eyes stand out and your mouth stand out, you know, learning to do the, uh, the line of the mouth, which is really important. And right now she, she's eyeless, but actually I can give her eyes today. Why not? Why not? I can do that. But making the eyes and mouth stand out on a face, if you're new, is uh, and a smooth base coat. Those are your like big tools. If you can do those things, your faces will look fantastic. And then over time, you can just get better at highlighting and shading. Also, always remember when you're learning that it's it can be frustrating because your eye of you know how something looks, your eye will get better faster than your hand will. So you're going to be able to look at the model and see, you know, how you want it to look. And you're going to be maybe disappointed because your your skill level isn't quite there. To, and you know it should be look like X and you can't make it look like X yet. Don't get frustrated. Just push past it. You just got to get through that. Um, every model you paint will get better as long as you're painting it with awareness. And by with awareness, I mean paying attention to how the, you know, I thinned my paint this much and this is how it's working. You know, I thinned my paint this much and boy, I don't like this or I do like it. You know, how does it work if I add a little more water? You know, that sort of thing. Experimenting, playing, play with it, play with your food or play with your paint. That uh, learning is fun. That's what it comes down to. And never get frustrated with yourself if you play and it fails. It's just a learning experience. Nobody is judging you on it. All right, so we're getting there. Um, MJ Studios, I think pastels are only useful when you're very large. Like in dolls, it makes sense because you're working with a big head. Um, but on these small of a model, I don't think it works. Uh, you could do it on a bust, but ah, pastels, I mean, it gives you a certain look. You could try it. It might work. Um, I mean, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. You'd have to work at a, with smaller brushes probably to apply the pastels. And you would of course have to seal the model, um, which, you know, changes sometimes how the paint will look. Um, I think personally, I think pastels, I've always felt that pastels are more trouble than they're worth because they're toxic to deal with. Um, ground pastels are actually one of the worst, most toxic things you can get your lungs near. So do use a respirator if you're going to do that. Anybody who doesn't is, is kind of clueless in my opinion. Um, cause yeah, it's not good. Don't, don't breathe that stuff. Uh, and I find that it's hard to control them. You can get nice smooth blends with them with a minimal effort, right? Cause you're just kind of, you're, you're blending, you're using big f soft brushes to blend them on. Um, it is certainly an art. Just be careful if you're using them. You'll get very different effects with them than you will get with paint or uh, like oils or, you know, but you can use almost anything on this stuff if you get big enough. I mean, any of those dull techniques will work on a, on a face that's big enough. Although do keep in mind that a lot of the dolls are looking for a very perfect look um, from what I've seen and very toy-like. And that isn't always what we're aiming for with miniatures. So it depends on what your goal is. I don't think, well, most of the time, that's where dry pigments came from, right, Alfe? It's, it's pastels. I mean, that's what they started just doing is uh, essentially grinding up pastel-like substances to create dry pigments. It's really the same beast. Um, and, and yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't breathe dry pigments either. <laughs> I don't like them because I find that it's hard to have control with them. And that is part of their charm, right? Um, too, is that you can get some interesting random and big broad blends and, uh, you can throw solvents in them to make them clumpy and get special effects that way. And I might use them for that because there's nothing quite else in the hobby market that works that way. Um, but I dislike how messy they are. I dislike how toxic they are. And they're making me use solvents, which I also don't like. So for me, they've always been more trouble than they're worth. I did play with them a bit and I was dissatisfied. In the end, I was like, well, I could have gotten this effect with paint um, with maybe just a little more time. So I do think they're great over metallics and for scenery. And uh, I know that vehicle painters, like guys who do really high level cars and tanks with weathering, love them for, uh, for weathering effects. I could totally see how that would work really good. Um, so yeah, I mean, try them out. Just be careful when you use them. Yeah, Miss Dimp's got it in one. They probably are the same thing, right, Miss Dimp? I thought they were just cheaper. 
Yeah, I don't know MJ Studio Arts. I don't know that you could even get, like, you'd have to get a tiny little, like, soft brush to really get. And I've only seen, I used to have some soft brushes for that sort of thing, but I think they're probably in my other carrier. But the, the smallest one that I could ever find was like this, which is way too big to get, you know, a smooth blend on things like, you know, Cheek Sun. And this is a big mini. I mean, she's easily almost a 70, she's got to be about a 70 millimeter. I have a ruler, I can tell. Hold on. And it's even within reaching distance. This is the advantage of having a small office. So from her feet to the top of her head, she is a 75 millimeter figure. So yeah, so this is a big mini. Like using, I can't see using pastels on little guys, really little guys. Because the key for 28 millimeter is control. And paint, acrylic paint is so good for the uh, smaller models because you can control it so well. Um... What to use the pastel triad for? The pastel triad are like, um, though that's blush pink, mint green, and uh, light blue. Am I correct? Uh, on that, Max Styles, is that that? Are we talking about the same triad? Morning Valandar. Let me make sure I've got more messengers. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, they're good highlighters, like mint, mint green especially is a great highlighter for blues. If you mix it into things like dragon blue, it'll give you a beautiful warm blue lighter highlight. And then you can actually use it on blue, especially if you're dealing with a mini that's like outdoors under sunlight, since sunlight has a slight golden hue um, at you know many times of day. So the fact that you're using a green to highlight a blue if you're under warm light uh, will really give you a really beautiful effect. Um, so things like that, and you could likewise use the light blue to highlight purples or blush pink to highlight purples, depending on where you want to go. Um, mostly I did them for utility highlighters because a lot of people don't want to mix paints. So you could use them to highlight their specific color groupings. So you could use blush pink to highlight reds. You could use mint green to highlight greens, and you could use light blue to highlight blues um, as a simple like triad fit in. If like you're using the blues triad, the 90, 16 to 17 to 18, and you needed a lighter blue than sky blue, I believe that light blue is a little bit lighter. So utility, utility paints. They're not really like clears. I would say that if you're looking for a lighter color that is more like the clears, you want to look at the glow triad from uh, the Kickstarter, Kickstarter four, um, runic glow and phantom glow. Is it phantom glow? It's, uh, there are three of them in there, and they are a lot more, they're a lot brighter. They're, they don't have as much white in them, so they're still good for, like, lighting effects and stuff. Where is my, there it is. Uh, so, Runic Glow. So, this is more violet and also darker than Blush Pink. Um, so, it's got a higher proportion of magenta and a touch of blue, I think, pigment in it. Um, so this is actually quite useful for doing glowing effects. I, uh, let me see here. What time is it? I'm so good. I can, I can go on a sideline here. Oh yeah. Hi rings. It's good to see you. Uh, oh yeah. Dry pigment on skills for dragons. That would work. That would work. So hold on. Let me show you guys the runic glow thing, the glowy thing. I'm going to unplug Justin from my ear for a second. Hey, if Michael Proctor can get out of his chair during his show to grab things, I can do it for mine. Let's see here. My chair definitely did not like me getting up that way, though. This is this is definitely a chair on its last legs. I was trying David's kneeling chair. He gave me his old one. And uh, I do like it. It really, it I do keep better posture, and it really um, helps my joints, uh, which surprised me, actually. Uh, although I, I vary with kneeling or just sitting in it. But uh, yeah, it's good. So, okay, Runic Glow, used as a glow effect. There! Um, this is a, I love this, I love to, to promote this company. Uh, Creepy Tables is the name of the company. Um, and uh, Powell's in uh, Poland. And uh, he has all sorts of really cute and beautiful sculpts. And this is one of them, is his Dryad of the Deep Woods. Uh, and she, uh, she's big, but he's just, he's got some great sculpts on that site. And, uh, he promoted, he, I actually used his sculpts for my class when I did, uh, sem the seminar in Napa last year. So here I'm using Runic Glow to do a, a glow effect. And it's quite, you can see against the dark background, it's quite bright. So I undercoated with white, 
then I used this color. You can see it's exactly the same color. And then I highlighted it a bit with white and created a little bit of a glow out here by blend, by using a layering brush stroke. So that's what, when I say that it's the glow triad, this is why I called it the glow triad. So yeah, super awesome dryad. Go look at Paula's site over on Creepy Tables. I don't know what shipping is like from Europe right now because a lot of com countries had uh, kind of shut down shipping out of the country while they were struggling lately. But um, he has some great stuff. Oh yeah, Tyrone is the ultimate dragon. That's like the biggest dragon outside of the GW Emperor dragon that was solid metal, I believe, Valandar, in history. Yeah, Max Styles, um, not really. I mean, there, there are just lighter versions of colors. They are single pigments in most, I think in all cases, actually, there are single pigment colors, except they have white added to them. So not a true single pigment color. You could use them as lighter versions of the clears, but they are quite light. I think that the, the glow colors are closer to what you're thinking, what you might be looking for. All righty. What am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm checking on the hair. All right, so that's actually coming up pretty well. It is uh, pretty pretty clumpy at this point, and to make it blend in a little bit better, I'll probably do a glaze of white. So let's do that. Let's glaze with white. Glazing with white is fraught with peril because it is so opaque. So you're trying to make a the most opaque color in existence, uh, thin down to almost nothing, and apply smoothly. So this can be tricky and takes a bit of practice. And you load so much water into it, you, you're you like, I cannot believe that I'm still adding water to this paint. But white takes a lot of water to go transparent, and that's what you want for a glaze. Hello, Monster Slayer Boss. So when you're doing, I always use my fingernail as a test when I'm trying to figure out if a light glaze is light enough. Because, of course, when you're working on a white palette, you can't really, putting it across the palette doesn't always work. So if you use your fingernail, you can kind of put a line of it down and see how transparent it is. And this is actually pretty good. Um, pretty, pretty transparent here. So I think I'm going to try this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when asking about glazing and keeping them from doing watermarks, the point here is to put the glaze all over the place and then to take your brush, go back or take a clean brush if you've got one already handy, which, you know, if you're not fast, you may want to just prepare a brush for this right now. Um, Go back with your clean brush and kind of wick off all the excess moisture. Unlike a wash, you do not want this to pool. What you're trying to do is lay down a very thin layer of uniform pigment over the surface. In this case, I'm doing it to try to blend in all of these hair strands, which look very choppy and very uniform, and you can definitely see the brush strokes. A glaze can be used to shift color, so it's going to shift our hair more towards silver overall. And then it can also be used to shift... shift um, like, add a, add a different quality to it. Like, if you want to go slightly more like more purple, more pink. You can intensify things by doing a glaze. You can blend your brush strokes by doing a glaze because it's going to muddy, muddy the waters visually. Uh, and maybe your brush strokes won't be as visible when you're done. So it has all glazing is an extremely high utility uh, technique. Definitely work on it. It's worth it. Um, when you do glaze over a larger area like this, I think I'm actually going to use a larger brush. Well, you have two choices. You could either unload your brush a lot and do like glazing just in small parts, like put a very thin layer of glaze over each of these clumps of hair, like just do a, a few clumps at a time. Uh, and that way you uh, can rinse out your brush real quick, come back and, you know, just grab off any little bits that might be pooling. Or you can do the glaze it all, darn it, fast uh, method, which is to use a big brush, as big as you can get away with, to cover the whole entire surface very quickly, then come back with your brush and wick it off. So let's do that. Let's do the crazy. Uh, so let's apply it like it's a wash, because this is the way I would apply a wash. Plop it all over the place. I'm using a lot of it for a reason. If I use more paint, it's going to take longer to dry. And so I want that, because I, if the minute this starts to dry, I'm screwed. Um... So we're going to pop it all over the place and we're going to put our brush down. We're going to grab our other brush and we're going to wick off all this excess. Start with the most important areas, like the front of the, the head. Expect to have to continually um, rinse your brush quickly and dry it quickly. But I'm just wicking off all this excess. I didn't, wherever I see it pooling, I want that to go away. Because I do not want watermarks. 
And since I did apply a lot of it, I can take my time here a little bit. But in general, attack the sections you care about the most first. Just in case things start to dry in the back end, you don't care so much about the rear of the model. In truth, I could have probably divided this head into two. Um, so I could have done one side of the hair first and then the other side. I would have been a little safer, but I'm pretty fast. So I decided I would try it. Um, if you do kind of wick up paint, like if you kind of rip paint up, try to do it in the cracks because you don't mind if the cracks are darker. You kind of want that. <laughs> so let's see here. We're getting now. Remember to get it out of that central uh, valley because we want that to be dark. The part of the hair should be dark. As you can see, I'm continually, since I'm using a smaller brush for this, I'm continually rinsing it out, drying it off, and coming back in. And I could use a larger brush for it, but if I want to be kind of precision, like if I am going to be like sucking moisture out around these braids, I do kind of want the, the thinner brush then, right? Because I'm, I'm taking very light touches to try to clear out some of this pooled liquid from around these braids. And a big brush would just hit the whole thing. But here I can be a little more precise maybe. So that's why I'm using it this way. And got a little bit more to clear out there, clear out there, clear out there. Now it's starting to dry. So if I'm gonna do anything else, I gotta be quick. Once your glaze starts to dry on a textured surface like this, you can get away with continuing to work while the glaze is drying. Because uh, any, any little like parts you strip up are gonna be disguised by the fact there's heavy texture on this. If you are working with a light glaze over something like a face, you would not be touching it still. Because if you pull up paint on a smooth surface like skin, you're going to see that brush stroke instantly. It's going to mar the entire surface. And then you're going to have to repaint the whole thing. So that's why I say that light glazes can be fraught with peril. Because it's if you're doing them on a big smooth surface, it can really be my nerve wracking. Like if I was doing like if I was doing a light cloak back here and I want to do a glaze on this, I would do it section by section, like fold by fold. Um, and probably just keep moving to try to make sure that I didn't get um, demarcation lines. Alternatively, I would use a giant brush, do the whole thing, and then use the giant brush to wick off everything as fast as I possibly could before it dried. Because I wouldn't want any brush strokes on big smooth surface. So, every color, Quinny. Every color. In fact, some of the best colors to glaze with are what we call the clear brights. So like clear red, clear blue, clear green, clear magenta. These colors, 9094 through 9099. Um, they're really vibrant and, and bright because they're single pigment only in clear base. So they're the brightest colors you can get in the MSP line. And a lot of people will do them uh, to intensify. Like if they paint a purple cape and they're like, oh, you know, this is good, but I wish it was, it was brighter because I used colors that were a little more dull because they covered better, but I want it to be bright. Then you could take clear magenta or clear purple and do a glaze over that cloak and you would intensify the whole thing. So yes, you can glaze with any dang color. Probably the only color that I never would glaze with would be like pure black. Um, I'd be uh, probably because because our pure black is so high coverage, I think I'd be more likely to use something like brown liner or blue liner um, if I had to blend in a dark area because those are those use a black pigment that are more is more naturally transparent. You don't have to fight it as much. Oh no, I made a brush stroke. Can I scrub it up? Sometimes you can scrub up when you do an oops. Now it looks like it's cured. So even when I'm thinning the paint this much, I still can't scrub it up afterward. And what that is, guys, is paint with good adhesion. A paint that is going to stick. I can guarantee if I was using a paint that was a lot more goopy and gummy that uses a more vinyl-like base, um, that if I loaded this up with water, I'd be able to strip it up. Yeah, glazing is useful for everything. Like, it really is. If, you, if you've got too much texture, or you've seen too much brush strokes, you want to change the color a little bit, or, yeah, any of that, any of that. It's not the same as a wash, though. A wash is going to, like, stick in your shadows and make them darker, right, after you apply it. It's just, it's a color shifter and brush stroke hider um, is what glazing is good for. And so that's why it's used in conjunction with layering, which is the, high, the, the wet in, on dry um, blending. Uh, technique that people use. Layer this this blue fold here was done with layering. Um, people use glazing in conjunction with layering because layering does leave like minute brush strokes. But if you glaze over the top, you can get that beautiful smooth blend effect. So 
that's that's why layering and glazing are like made for each other. So usually when I teach um, my layering class at ReaperCon, it's actually a layering and glazing class so I can show people how to do both. Because I really think they're two of the most important techniques in your arsenal as a painter, possibly the two most important techniques, other than just learning to thin your paint. All right. Yeah, and the great thing about layering too is that it's very precise, right? So you can hit all those fine details on your little models and bring them out. All right, so we glazed. Now her hair is much lighter. I think we su successfully made it lighter and it's also, the strands are a lot more subtle now. It's not just lines on gray. So that's great. So now we can actually come back in and relighten with some thicker pure white. Try to hit these uh, higher areas a little bit more build our light up even more. And this is really what I do for pure white is I work with thinned white and I build it up in layers, um, brighter and brighter. So that way I can get it to blend a little easier. All right. Yeah. Just this area where, the, um, where the paint, where the hair comes out before it drops down is going to probably pick up some highlights. So yeah, we did, I, I went totally off topic today. We did painting white we talked about color composition and we talked about glazing um, we generally did not stick to task, but we did make progress, so I uh, can't complain too much. And I'm enjoying painting this figure, so I may continue tomorrow, because I do want to do more fine detail uh, stuff. I guess I do have, I guess I could go a little long. Hmm, I guess I could go a little longer and do do fine details real quick. So we're not totally off topic with our, our posted topic. Are you still awake, Justin? How you doing? I am here. All Sorry, right. I've been kind of diligently working. Oh, that's cool. Well, I, I may go just a little longer today and uh, cover some fine detail stuff. No problem. All right, cool. I don't think our viewers will complain if I took a poll. <laughs> you have a point. You have a point. And if they did complain, they'd just leave anyway and they'd pick, catch up on it later. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, let's do that then. But you guys got a bonus feature on painting white hair. So, ta-da. So now we have silver hair. I still have a dark shadow around her face. It's bothering me a little bit. So I'm going to make that a little bit. Uh... Justin hasn't turned me off yet. Yeah, right. He can hit the kill switch if he really needs to. I'm going to lighten this shadow. Part of the shadow, actually, when I look at it, it's the paint isn't as dark as it looks in the uh, on the camera. It's actually just that this hair has such a huge overhang around her face, so it's definitely coming off as uh, darker in here than it actually is. So she just has a really deeply sculpted shadow there. Can lighten it up just a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's pretty dark. Pretty dark. Now it does make her face stand out, so I'm not complaining too much. All right, so let's do this little thing here with all of these tiny stitch things. Let's let's do that for fine details. I think I want to use... Now we're still talking about... Um, also about color composition. So I've got two choices here. I've got... I've decided to go like um, red for this. It's going to be... Uh, have some gold on it probably, but I also have some dark colors coming down around it. Um... So I could, I could go dark with this leather and it would probably work against the gold here. I could also go light with it because some of this, uh, she's got kind of a loincloth on. This is where we have to kind of pay attention to what she's actually wearing, right? Because this shirt actually comes down to here, but then it's interrupted by this, this, uh, thing, this armor thing, loincloth that comes down to here. She has like super amounts of layers. This is a very overdressed frost giant. I don't care how cold you're getting seriously and it, this also has a decorative border so this could be purely decorative this little loin thing that comes down but it does look like it has metal plates on it so probably gonna do those in silver or gold and that means i really need to go dark with this because if i think about it if i've got some gold or some uh lighter leather up here because i would need it to contrast with this so if this is like if this little thing is actually a strap holding the dagger in place, which it seems likely that it might be, um, I've got dark right up here, and this could be light to stand out against that, but then this that means this definitely needs to be dark. So let's go dark. I'm going to use russet brown as my base for that leather. 
Yeah, it's good for Drow um, and for Frost Giants and for pretty much anybody you want to do a lighter hair color on. I mean, I, I would put a lot more work into it at this point uh, to really make it lighter, but uh, I'm limited on time and I want to actually cover some fine details for you guys. So that is the problem with the stream. It's just like it's so easy to get distracted and so easy to not finish things out because you got to keep moving and uh, cover the topics. And I didn't get to the wolf pelt yet. Oh, well. Yeah, so all right, starting with Russet Brown, which is $91.99, which is my um, chosen base for darker leather. It is a dark brown, as you can see. It is our Master Series equivalent for Artist Burnt Umber. So if you are a 2D artist or had experience with as one in the past and you really like Burnt Umber, this is your color. Uh, I like it as a base for dark leather because it's not nearly as dark as stuff like Walnut or Blackened Brown, which I usually use to shade it. Uh, so I start with this, I go to that, and I usually will highlight it by mixing in either chestnut gold if I want a very saturated color or driftwood brown if I want a more muted out kind of dusty beat up leather. Really like the russet brown driftwood combo actually. So we'll see. But the, she has a lot of very saturated colors on her. So we'll see what we want to do. So first we're going to put down our base coat. Just going to paint this whole thing with this color because even if I want to bring in some metal fixtures or some uh, different colors later, I can just paint right over the top. It is the beauty of acrylic paints, and it's much faster to take an intricate area and just base coat it all, and then worry about it afterwards. That way, at least you have a solid coat down, especially on bones, nice solid base coat. And uh, the other reason to love 9199 Russet Brown is that, as you can see, it covers like a champ. It does have good coverage. Nice solid paint, has a lot of yellow in it, so it's very warm. And uh, can shift in many different directions, depending on what you highlight it with. So let's see here, what do we got? We got some fixtures, but I'm gonna do these little braid things, I think, down here. So I'm gonna take some of this. I've got, I loaded up a lot of paint on this thing, but that means it's gonna take forever to dry. So I'm gonna take some of it off with my brush while it's still wet. The more, uh, the more paint you load onto your model, whether it's wet or you know, whether it's whether it's unthinned or thinned, the longer it will take for it to dry. If you are in a very arid climate, then everything might dry almost instantaneously. If you are in my old climate in uh, North Texas or something like it, or in the South that's humid, or even out here um, in the Bay Area, which is definitely, although it is dry, it has a surprising amount of humidity because we're close to the ocean. Um, so it takes a little while for things to dry. Let me set up my other colors while I'm doing this. I'll actually do a wash on this one. I think there's a lot of little details there. I don't know. Oh, see, the thing is, okay. So the thing is with washes and the, the reason I don't do them very often is that the applying the wash is going to essentially knock down this entire color to darker. So then if I want it to come back to this russet brown color, I have to rebase coat and leave the, the dark in the cracks. And at that point, in my mind, I may as well have just like hand lined all this stuff instead of done the wash because it hasn't really saved me any time. So that's my, like my personal wash philosophy and why I don't often use them. Uh, is that uh, in the end, especially for something that's smaller like this, I could go in and outline this stuff faster and not have to repaint all of my top layer and not, not shift my color by putting that wash over it. So that is the downside of washes being heavier bodied. Uh, GW contrast paints are, you know, based around trying to eliminate this problem because they are very thin over the top areas and very thick where they pool. And they've done a pretty good job of that, but it will still shift your color. So do keep in mind that if you want russet brown and you don't want it to change, and this is the color you want, that your mileage with washes may vary and it may be better just to paint in your shadows. Um, so I'm going to use some black and brown and I'm just going to paint those in. And when you're doing fine details, you do have to shade or you have to highlight more than you otherwise might. And the point here is, again, we talk about this all the time with mini painting. It is the great mini painting uh, soapbox is contrast. In order to make small details stand out, you need to make them very different. And so the way to do that is to heavily shade around them and then to highlight them so that you get a lot of contrast in here. So I will shade around all of these little stitches with a darker color 
especially up into the cracks like under this flap and then I will go and highlight them to make them pop. And that is how you do fine details. If you're dealing with a belt buckle, you're gonna do it the same way, except you're gonna do it more like what I'm doing up here on these shields where I uh, did the black or the walnut coat first. So essentially you're laying down a walnut coat and then you put down a bright color on top of it, but you leave a little bit of the walnut or black around the edges. And that will give you the contrast so that you can see, eventually you'll be able to see all these little tiny symbols on her shield. So that is what you're doing. It doesn't matter if it's a belt buckle, if it's a tiny strap, work on contrast. In this case, you're not doing color comp composition contrast where you're trying to do one area a very different color than another. You're actually working within the area. So like doing these straps on her, on her hand and stuff, if they were tiny, if these little stitches on her leg, I'm gonna essentially use a very dark shadow to back each one of those and then I'm gonna use a lighter color over the top of it and I'm gonna probably use quite a bit of lighter color to highlight it to make it stand out. So that is really what you wanna do. And that's why I fill in eye sockets with a dark color because then when we go and take um, put a white of the eye in there, usually I would not use pure white for these, but, but then when you put a strip of white over that, you leave that dark outline around the outside get a little more white on my brush a little tiny more white but then you're, you're it's contrast you're making that eye stand out because you put a dark edge around it and then you're putting a light area it within it and that makes that detail really pop see how that eye just pops out at you now and it's not just the white because the white normally isn't that different of a color with the skin but it's that dark area around it that makes that detail really stand out and adds to her expression. So that's the same fundamental thing that you're doing with all of these tiny details. It's why people like washes because they put the shadow in quick for you and then you can just kind of, you know, highlight over the top and get that effect. Um, and that works great. If you don't mind that you're shifting your color, rock it. Cause washes are a good fast technique. And uh, especially if you're on limited time or you have a big model or several frost giants to paint, I would totally do washes. You can even see that my base coat up here on the vest turned out kind of as a heavy wash. Like I can see I had a lighter color underneath it and I can still see the stitches here or the studs um, showing up through it. So it actually, my base coat turned out more like a heavy wash because I got some detail from it. So you can utilize them to great effect if you are uh, low on time or you have a lot of models to paint. Let's see here. So I'm going to maybe, I, I grabbed black and brown, but I might use walnut for these little tiny in-between stitches things because it's darker. Essentially, you see the darker of a color you use and the lighter of a highlight you use, the more stuff will stand out. So if you're doing like a little tiny belt buckle, you might line it or shade around it in black or walnut, something very close to black. And then you will uh, highlight it with silver and the silver is so bright next to that really dark shadow that your little tiny belt buckle can stand out and be seen easily. And I'm just pretty much just dabbing some color up into the shadow underneath the flap here. And I'm not worrying about blending because these colors are so close, the russet brown and the walnut are so close, they almost blend themselves. So it's really hard to see. I probably could have got this white backdrop, hold on. Yeah, now you can see better. There we go. Cameras are great. This camera is great, but it still has uh, the issue with the backdrop color shifting the way you see the color, the model. So hold on, let me get close. There we go. Let's do this. Yeah, I mean, that's what washes are really good for. Oh, thanks, John. I was just like really annoyed at my camera because I thought it wasn't. <laughs> I'm trying to make it... Uh... I'm always trying to make my camera behave really well so you guys can see, but if I'm doing tiny details like this, trying to keep it at the right height to the relative to the camera so you can really see what I'm doing. Um, so that's shading between, you can see the wet paint, shading between all those stitches. Hello, my love. How's it going? And then when I go in and highlight, this dark color is going to make my outer stitches really pop out and stand out. Um, and I would do the same thing while I'm working with my walnut. I may as well do things like lining around this strap here. I don't know yet if this strap is going to be a different color 
than the rest of the bag. But if I decide to make it the same color and I just want all the details to be the same leather but still to stand out, doing a dark shadow is the way to go. And this little buckle, this does actually have a tiny little buckle clasp. It has little studs. I'm gonna outline all those. I'm gonna paint over them actually, just, just paint right over. When you have little studs, just paint them all dark. The whole stud. Just leave, make sure you leave some, some dark like right around the stud too. Make sure you're not just painting the upper area of the stud. Because later when you come back and you want to paint those in a metal color, uh, you want them to show up. So you do want a little bit of dark around them at the very base of their the stud. And I'm going to just line this whole thing because I can. And I've got my walnut open, so I might as well. Get it all kind of painted in and shaded at once. And once again, I could do a wash here, but then it would darken down my russet brown a lot. And I'd have to reapply that color um, over the top if I wanted to bring it back up. So it's essentially adds an extra step for me. And that's what defines whether I will use a wash or not is like, do I want this whole thing to go darker? Do I not mind? Or what, is it going to make extra work for me? If it's going to make extra work for me. I'm not going to use a wash. I'm just going to paint my shadows in like I am right now. All right, so there we are. So now you can see, even with just that uh, that shadow, the details are standing out a lot better. And now I can make a highlight color. I did lose a little bit of paint off the top front of that, though, didn't I? Boop. Oh, really, Krispies? What did you think of your airbrush, and what kind do you have? I'm going to mix up a highlight for this. Let's see. Do I want to go really warm or do I want to go softer? Hmm, I'm going to go softer. I'm going to use my favorite driftwood. Driftwood brown is actually in the shield brown triad, but it also makes a lovely highlight for russet brown when you blend the two together. So I'm going to grab a couple of drops or brush holes. Same thing when I'm using a big brush of the russet. I'm going to add a couple drops of the driftwood. Mockingbees. Yep. Thanks. No problem, Margaret. Have fun with your Mockingbees. Those are so cute. Oh, okay. Yeah, it does. It does take time to get used to, right? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I've used mine. I've played with it a little bit, you know, over the years, but I really need to sit down and just paint with it. Like, I need to just get out all of the huge dragons that I have that are currently in a box in my closet and I need to just practice airbrushing on them. Like I've got, I've got the original um, resin nether mall, which is much larger than the nether mall in the, uh, that was produced for bones. I've got him and I've got a resin Maldricar and I've got a regular Maldricar and I've got, yeah, I've got all these big dragons. Um, so, and they're the great, they're, they're great to practice on because they are so big. So I just need to to get get on it, and uh, unfortunately we have um, we have a table off of the side of our painting tables here, and we were debating whether we wanted to do a a photo pad with uh, the big soft box for miniatures photography, or if we wanted to do an airbrushing studio. And sadly, both of them won't fit. So I think we're pretty much going to go with the photo pad, and we'll just have to make some time to get our airbrushes out. Maybe we'll do an airbrush weekend coming up sometime, and just. Play with airbrushes. It kind of sounds fun. All right, so I've got about, I actually added a couple more drops of um, driftwood. So it's a four drops of driftwood to two russet, and it's because russet is just so strong. Um, so, and it gives me a, a noticeably, you want a noticeably lighter color than your original russet brown, and it definitely does that. So we're gonna move this back. Uh, photos, uh, because it would like when I finish a model that's nice, I want to take a photo for my website, and David does. Um, he does a blog on his website, um, which I also do sometimes, but he does really cool blogs about how he did projects. So he wants to get high quality photos of works, work in progress steps often. Um, and it's so much easier when you don't, when you have a setup and you don't have to just set something up because I mean, yeah, you can take just your phone photo against whatever you've got, but it's just not going to give you a really high quality photo usually. So 
it's better if you have a photo pad set up with good lighting. Uh, he has a soft box, so he has um, a thing we can set up with diffuse lighting. We just need to get our lighting set. Uh, that way you can just go over, flip on the lights, and take a really good picture with a backdrop you've got set up that you know works. Uh, so it, it saves time. Since both he and he, he and I both do high-level painting, so we do a lot of uh, competition models that we're trying to, uh, you know, to do, maybe do a work in progress on, or or I do Patreon, so you know I want to be able to take nice photos, a uh, nice work in progress photos, of uh, nicer ones for my PDFs. Um, so it's useful just to have a photo set up at that point. Yeah, it's good. There's uh, when you've got more time to watch streams and it inspires you to try a new thing with painting. That's the best. Like every time I watch like Michael Proctor or Justin doing airbrush work, um, it does get me excited to try airbrushing. So that's totally a thing. All right, so just highlighting pretty much toward the edge here to get the leather just a little bit uh, lighter. See how that makes those. See how just putting that lighter highlight toward the edge here, where we've got this dark line. How that makes that flap stand out more so you can utilize that everywhere on here i'm going to leave this plate is probably metal so i'm going to leave it alone this strap up here i might do in a different leather color but just to show you guys do a little bit of outlining in there and it makes everything stand out yeah crispies um phones are made to kind of compensate for us these days, right? But it's still, you can still take like miles better photos by just using a nice consistent backdrop. I usually use this backdrop, medium gray. Uh, I just ordered a bunch of uh, new gray paper to use for backdrops because I just find that gray gives you the best um, results with no matter what camera you're using. So now I'm going to take this color and I'm going to hit all these little stitches and it is going to make all of my little stitches stand out really well. I'm going to uh, concentrate on um, kind of toward the end of the stitch because where a stitch like goes down into leather, it usually has a little bit of a bump. And really, these stand out enough that I could just use the side of my brush and just kind of run my brush over the top of them without getting the paint down into the recesses. But you see even one highlight makes those stitches really stand out a little bit better. Yeah, I also, I take a lot of photos with my phone, just art reference stuff um, when we're at galleries or, you know, museums or when I'm out walking. I do a lot of, I, I get a lot of inspiration from nature, so I take a lot of photos of like tree roots or f particular flowers with colors that I like or, you know, any, any interesting textures or things that might help me make a cool miniatures thing in the future. I'm just going to do a quick highlight because I want to call this pretty soon. I'm going to mix some white with that highlight I just did and do a higher highlight to show you guys how it really makes the details stand out. The brighter you go, um, the more the laces will show up. Because now the reason I'm using the same highlight on these laces as I am on these big flaps, but the big flaps are showing up more crisply because they're bigger. And that's why it's so important because these laces are so tiny to go up extra highlights after you have done a dark shadow. Because um, that will, the more contrast... The smaller the detail, the more contrast is necessary for it to stand out. So it depends on how much you want this stuff to stand out. But if you really do want these little details to pop, you do have to highlight them more than you'd think. So just a tiny little, tiny little highlight. And you see how much down of that, boom, suddenly you see all those fine details because, ta-da, um... Yeah, there is. There, yeah, we were talking about it. It's got to be a dwarf caribou. We think they breed them for food. Yeah, getting good macro photos with a DSLR can also be, you know, a learning experience. So I totally get the phone photos thing. I mean, in most cases, I'm using phone photos. But if I want to get really good phone photos, I find I do need to have a good photo setup. Um... I get a lot of people, I see a lot of people trying to take work in progress photos of their miniatures and they just are holding their, they're, they're using like a deep shadow, like their computer keyboard behind them or something. And I'm just like, get a piece of paper, great paper. It works so well. It will help. Um, 
or even like a gray blue or whatever. Although if you use a color, it does tend to shift the camera's comprehension of colors unless you uh, use a, um, like a, a, I forget what they call it. What do they call it guys? When you, when you, Justin, do you know what you call it when you use a color bar in the photo to get better color adjustment? Uh, color correction? This, or... Like when you use, what's the, what's it called? What's the little red, yellow, or red, yellow, blue, black, oh, white? The the color wheel within the program is that what you're asking no you talking about something you actually put in the frame of the photo to get the camera oh, to adjust right yeah yeah gray card is what people are it, it's a white balance card is what it is okay yeah there you but, go uh, Mist uh, Max yeah, Styles it's has for it. it's for white balance yeah well and white balance is uh i like found this out when i was doing videos is white balance is a totally different thing on video correction than it is on like photo correction yeah um, it can be harder um because yeah. the theory is once you tell the camera exactly what white is, yeah. then it knows, based on its color science on what they've programmed right. in the sensor, um, what red is and what hot, you know, hot red right. is and what brown is, et cetera. Right, yeah. So essentially, yes, exactly. So if you use a colored backdrop, you, in my opinion, you really need a gray card because otherwise your camera may shift color uh, in your photo and your miniature may not look uh, the way that it actually looks, uh, which is why I use a neutral gray with no cast toward blue or yellow, uh, blue or brown, because I find that it gives me the best color representation when I'm doing uh, photos or video, um, for that matter. Beauty, beauty of that too, though, is with the uh, technology that exists today, as long as you're shooting in like a very neutral uh, like picture profile or yeah. if you're using shooting in raw, which is optimal because you have the most data, um, as long as there's something somewhere in the frame of the picture or the video at some point, then uh, you can you can correct it after right. the fact. You don't even need to shoot it right in camera. Yeah, although as you have told me, it's always better to get it as good as you can beforehand because then you don't have oh, to yes. fix it in post. Correct. Yeah, so I like to kind of follow that uh, philosophy when I'm doing my photos. I want to get the best photo possible so I don't have to correct it very much afterwards. So, all right, I'm just putting a thin line of this light color now around the edges of these uh, little panels to make them all fit up. But now you can see guys, look, look, all the details pop out and it's because we shaded with really dark colors and then uh, used lighter highlights on our tinier areas. And if I want the tongue of that buckle to do the same, I will highlight a little bit around the edges of it to bring it out, to give it contrast. It's all about contrast. The only thing we're doing is putting a lighter color against a darker. And so that's how you make tiny details like these stitches really pop out. So that you can see them and you can see it's not overwhelming it just becomes a very pleasing uh part of the model at that point obviously and you can see how this actually works the same way freehand does the tighter and more intricate uh globs of detail the more your eye goes to it because when i put her down here now i'm just like my eye goes right to that bag like it goes to her face and then it goes to the bag because the bag is really tight and crisp um so remember that too when you're uh when you're deciding to paint really intricate things like down here on the model, it may backfire on you. You may have to pay more attention and tighten up everything up top too. Uh, but yeah, doo -doo. yep. It's a, it's a, I think it's a caribou based on the horns. Um, so it's a dwarf caribou because we, we all thought that the giant needed to be at least an inch taller for that to be actual caribou size. Um, but we just decided that they breed dwarf caribou. Uh, and that's it. They're just, just because they're easier snack packs. All righty. All right, guys, any closing questions? Like, you didn't quite get to see me do, like, her eyes yet, but we're working along on her. I hope you're enjoying her. I actually, uh, I when I first looked at this model, it was just so crowded, and there was so much crap on her, and uh, I've just only noticed that she has a tiny little helmet on her. <laughs> it's got to be a, a, a helmet for a halfling kid, because, again, we wish the giant was a head taller, but um, it's a tiny little helmet here on her uh, waistband, too. So there's just, and then there's a couple of heads, like there's a head and I think another bag. Oh my God. There's just so much. And I hate, I hate painting severed heads. They're the worst. They're never a color that you, that you want on the figure. It's, it just seems like they're like a weird thing that you have to paint totally differently. So anyway, there you go. There's Ms. Giant. Um, I may work on her again tomorrow. I want to do the wolf pelt. Uh, I want to get, maybe do these to make them stand out. Maybe the jewelry and all this stuff. Um, so I'd like to continue on her just to continue showing her how to make everything stand out. I guess caribou, are caribou and reindeer the same thing? I thought they were. 
But yeah. So yeah, so there's that is how you make little details stand out. Ta da's. Yay, giant. All right. Uh you got a raid for us, Justin? I do, and I think I found someone we've never raided before. They're Ooh. painting minis, and it looks like it's either a married couple or a couple or or just a you know, a, a couple that are streaming. Yeah, awesome. What are they painting? Let's see, it looks like um Warhammer Age of Sigma. Oh, cool. Say. There's some cool models in that in that range. Awesome. Super. Well, fantastic, guys. Go and spread the Reaper love and make sure these people know who Reaper are if they don't. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Make sure they know who, uh, who Reaper are. Yeah, ask them if they've ever painted any Reaper miniatures. But we love to spread the love and the awareness. So thank you for tuning in, everybody. I had a lot of fun today. It's been a it's been a Monday, Wednesday, you know, so far for me. But I think it's going to improve. I, I have a feeling about today. It's going to be good. So I hope all of you have great days. And uh, I will see you again tomorrow morning, bright and shiny. And maybe we'll paint some wolf fur. And we'll figure out what the heck to do with this armor. And, yeah, you know, we'll do all sorts of stuff. Um, so, yeah. Oh, wait, wait, ranger and caribou are the same species. Thank you. Reaper John with the biology or zoology um, aid there. Excellent. All right. You guys have a great day. Go out and spread the love, okay? We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Awesome, guys. Thank you for coming out.